Folks, I'd like to introduce to you uh, the Speaker Pro Tem of the House of North Carolina, Representative Dale Falwell. I had the privilege of serving with Dale as a, as a co Senate co-chair when he was the House co-chair on the Appropriations for General Government. And I learned really quickly that uh, the guy always, you see all this stuff that he has with him? He's always got that kind of stuff with him. He's a policy wonk, and I say that in the, in the best sense of the word. Uh, he is a driving force uh, this year behind workman's compensation reform. And uh, I could spend a lot of time telling you about how good of a guy he is, but I'm really glad he's running for lieutenant governor. And so, Dale, why don't you come on up here and tell the folks uh, all about yourself. Thank you. How are you this afternoon? Good. My last name is Falwell. That will be easy to remember. And uh, <laughs> uh, but hopefully this won't last as long as a, as a, as a sermon. But uh, it's really great to, uh, to be back in Franklin. I've been in Franklin every time I've been invited, and uh, I've always felt welcome. I'm a candidate this year for a lieutenant governor, and I want to say that uh, I'm probably the most unlikely person to ever be applying for this job. Because I got here with my hands and my back, which affected my heart and changed my mind about the need to be educated. And I think what's happened to our state and what's happened to our country is that uh, the sense of entitlement has been replaced by the joy of achievement. And I don't think you can ever have the joy of achievement until you learn to work with your hands. Because when your hands start getting calloused and your back starts hurting, then that's what ultimately changes your heart and changes your mind. I want to say that uh, it's, been a, uh, it's been a great day to, to be in Western North Carolina. And I want to touch on a few things that nobody in this room probably woke up this morning thinking about. And it's the invisible. The invisible things that are happening in North Carolina and the reason that this state is in the condition it's in. I was with some folks last night in Durham from New Jersey. Now let me tell you five things this morning that I would trade with the state of New Jersey. I would trade my four year high school graduation rate for theirs. I would trade my ability to get kids graduated from college in four years with theirs. I would trade our unemployment rate with theirs. I would trade my gas tax for theirs. I would trade my Suda and Thuda taxes, which is not something you woke up this morning thinking about, but it's going to impact every employer in North Carolina with theirs. You woke up thinking about it. I'd trade their governor too. Yes. And my point of telling you that is that those are just five examples of how we are in worse shape, Chris, than New Jersey is. And the reason we're in that bad of shape is that for decades and centuries almost, liberals in Raleigh did not liberate. The root word of liber liberal is to liberate, to set free, so that no one ever has control of you, over you again. But what's happened is this has been the lost decade. It's been the lost decade in North Carolina in education. It's been the lost decade in crime. It's been the lost decade because government employ employment has gone up while in personal private employment has gone down. It's been the lost decade in almost every sense of the word. What I've tried to, <coughs> what I've tried to do in Raleigh is I've tried to listen and act and fix. So I'm going to talk to you about some invisible things here that you didn't wake up this morning thinking about. The first one is workers' compensation. Now, you don't think about workers' compensation, but this idea came to me three years ago from a person in Mount Airy, North Carolina that I was buying a headstone from. And he told me that he could move his plant two miles up the road and save enough money on workers' comp premium, thank you, Senator, to hire another person for a whole year. Now, why should you care about that comment? a small business person. The reason you should care is that as we stand here this morning, the largest employer in 18 counties of North Carolina is the unemployment check. The largest employer in Mecklenburg County today 
is not Bank of America. It's not the school system. It's not the big hospitals. It's the unemployment check. So when a small business person ever says to somebody like me, if you reform something, I might be able to hire another person for a whole year, that gets my attention. Because the way we're going to climb out of this hole is one person, one tax dollar savings, one being more efficient with your tax dollars is going to be like an ain't eating a ham biscuit. It's going to be one bite at a time. So I want you to take your thinking just for a moment from Mount Airy, North Carolina to Fayetteville. There is a Goodyear plant in Fayetteville. They have to manufacture 3,000 car tires a day to pay the workers' comp premium of that plant every day. So you have a little business example, you have the large business example, but then when I went back to Raleigh and Senator Davis helped me with this, I started thinking about the fact, who is the largest employer in the state? The state. My point of telling you that as conservatives and Republicans is don't go out of here witnessing and trying to convert people by saying that you know, you're for small business, you're for large business, you're for individual liberty. That's all true. What I'm trying to communicate to you is that any reform that we do at the state government that benefits you as an individual or you as a small business person or you as a major corporation, almost everything that we do to reform your state government benefits the state government more than anyone else. Because we are the largest purchaser of health care. We're the largest purchaser of fuel. We're the largest paver of roads. We're the largest purchaser of electricity. Anything that we do to lower the cost of living and doing business in this state benefits the state and the taxpayers more than anyone else. Now, I've given you the example of the workers' comp system, but I think this will kind of put it in perspective for you. When I'm in Raleigh, and I think Jim's heard me talk about this, I constantly think about how we are out of tune with the states that border North Carolina. Let's assume for a moment this is the shape of California and this is the shape of North Carolina. But for 55 miles, we have as much border with other states as they do. Never thought about that, did you? But no one in this room can name a major population area in California that borders another state. Think about North Carolina. Asheville, Charlotte, Wilmington, where I was yesterday, Mount Airy, North Carolina, Boone, North Carolina, Winston-Salem is 42 miles from the border. The reason I say that to you is that when we start talking about reforming government, we have to talk about not only lowering the cost of living and doing in business in this state relative to Mexico or India or wherever else people are producing products, we need to think about Virginia and Tennessee and South Carolina. Now the reason I'm having you think that way is that these are the workers' compensation laws of Tennessee, South Carolina, and Virginia. These are yours. Oh, oh. <laughs> They're equal. And what I'm telling you folks is that if we can focus as conservatives and the Republicans on the invisible things that nobody ever talks about, we can fix this unemployment situation. Now, after this bill became effective, and I ran in here too quickly, I received an email from Goodyear, and the email went something like this. Representative Falwell, thank you for the reforms to the workers' comp system. Unfortunately, after the bill became law, we had a person injured in our Goodyear plant. And because of the changes that you did, instead of reserving $400,000 for this claim, we only had to reserve $250,000. That's $150,000 that now can remain in the Fayetteville area for future employment or capital expenditures. Because of what you did to the suitability requirement, instead of this employee being out of work for the rest of their life, because in North Carolina, in this book, if you received a temporary TTD, temporary, she's shaking her head, a temporary designation for disability, 
you received a lifetime benefit. So instead of this person being out of work for the rest of their life, it looks like they're going to be able to gain, come back to employment between 18 and 24 months from now. So the company saved money for the reserve. The person is going to be able to come back to active employment. And my point of telling you this story is that we can all pat ourselves on the back by being conservatives and by being Republicans and sponsoring legislation and getting it through the House and getting it through the Senate and sometimes even the governor signing it. But that's not enough. The root word of conservative is to conserve and to get more out of less. That's why I'm going to share with you the second paragraph. Representative Falwell, you may not be aware, but Goodyear decided earlier this year to close the Union City, Tennessee plant. The Union City, Tennessee plant is the sister plant to Fayetteville. It's the same size, makes the same product, and has the same number of employees, 3,000 employees. One leading factor from our headquarters as to why they decided to close that plant and not the North Carolina plant was the lower workers' compensation costs and the reform that was going on in the system. We always talk about all the companies that are thinking about coming to North Carolina, but the bottom line is we need to start paying attention to the ones that are already here, that have been here for years and decades and centuries in some cases, paying taxes and doing the right thing. That's the invisible. The other invisible that I've worked on over the last 12 months was the Unborn Victims Bill. For five years, I've carried this picture in my pocket. I don't mean to upset anybody. This looks like your children and your grandchildren, doesn't it? This is what a child looks like eight and a half months in utero, never delivered, mother was killed. And I carry this picture around in my pocket because in North Carolina, we did not have a law that allowed district attorneys to charge somebody with two murders instead of one if they murder or harm a pregnant woman. Now this has been on the initiative of the Republican women's organizations across North Carolina for decades. This particular piece of legislation has been sitting in committee for 25 years. California has had this law since Charles Manson killed Sheriff Taylor. And it took us until 2011 to get into North Carolina. The third invisible that I'll talk about is the invisible of the bigotry and low expectations in our public education system. I am sick and tired of having a public education system and a bureaucracy that looks at a child and says, you're not going to ever amount to anything. Because that's the way they look at me. We need to put the joy of achievement back in these students. We need to let them understand consequences and rigor. We need to remove the bureaucracy that gets flushed down from the federal government to the state government, and then the state government tries to flush that bureaucracy down on this county in western North Carolina. You know, the federal government provides us about 5% of our funding and about 40% of the regulation. You're going to have to have a lieutenant governor who has the courage not just the mind. We have lots of people with good minds. Not just the heart. We have people with good hearts. And not just the stomach. We have people with good stomachs. We need a lieutenant governor who has the stomach, the heart, and the mind to get into these state agencies and reform state government. Somebody, someday, is going to have to tell the federal government, we don't want your 4% of your money. And Oh, by the way, we're not going to start, we're not going to adhere to your 40% of your regulation either. That's what, we need. That's what you need. And you need the courage to do that. And conservative is not something you say, it's something you have to do and you have to act. And the people you're negotiating with understand the root word of conservative it is to conserve. Now, we talk about the regulation that the state places on you as individuals and you as a business person and you as a large corporation. You would not believe the regulation the state places on itself. We built a middle school up in Winston-Salem a year or so ago, and Diener, anybody ever heard of Diener? <laughs> Diener came in and made us put a runoff pond in. 
Now, I'm a motorcycle mechanic and I'm a forensic accountant, <clears throat> so runoff ponds are just not my specialty. <laughs> but I understand a runoff pond is to collect excess water. So, Chris, when they made us put that runoff pond in, they deemed her. Now, this is the state regulating another agency of the state. So when they made us put that runoff pond in, they made us put vegetation in. Guess what happened last year? The vegetation died because there was no water in the pond. Guess what they want us to do now? Irrigate it. <laughs> now everybody in this room has their own example of the incredibly stupid stuff the state government tries to make us do. And the reason that it's important that we get control of the executive branch is something that many of you heard back in the 60s. If you control the music and I control the law, eventually you'll win. If you control the agencies of state government and I'm able to pass laws and legislation, you still win. The, the agencies of North Carolina, and Jim knows this, are absolutely thumbing their nose at the laws that we passed this year and the legislative intent in those laws. President Obama is going completely around the U.S. Congress with these executive orders, and Governor Perdue is doing the exact same thing. And the reason I'm telling you this, and the reason it's got to be important to you, is that Republicans have misled you. You're the employer of the elected officials. The Republicans have misled you to think that we can go to Raleigh or go to Washington, and this is like a piece of country ham. We can just take a scaffold, and we can just trim the fat off, and all of our lives are going to be back to normal. Folks, this is marbleized meat. Every agency of state government, I know that's kind of grisly to think about, but <laughs> I actually like marbleized meat, but, but every agent of your state government, there's some meat and there's some fat just really embedded in it. It's deep down in there. And you have to have a lieutenant governor who knows how to work with their hands to get into these agencies, to make these agencies understand that if there's no business, there's no profit. And if there's no profit, there's no taxes. And if there's no taxes, there's no government. And if there's no government, they don't have a job. That's what we have to do. I'm going to close by saying a couple more things to you. Last year was a historic year. And I'm going to talk about number 31. And number 31 is sitting right over here to my left, Senator Davis. Because what we did last year is that we were handed one of the worst budget deficits in the United States as a percentage. They would not even release the staff to us until 12 hours before we gaveled in. So we had to hit the ground running and we had to close one of the largest budget crises in the United States and cut the sales tax, which is what we promised you we would do. And we did all of that by the second week of June. Now why does any of you, why would any of you care about the second week of June? The reason is, is that for as long as I've been in the legislature, we don't pass our budget until July and sometimes August. So what are the school districts of Western North Carolina doing? Because they're depending on us to pass our budget so that they can pass theirs. That's just downright rude. So we passed our budget in the second week of June. And then we came back and did redistricting. It's the fastest, most expeditious redistricting process in North Carolina history that was pre-cleared by the Obama administration Justice Department. Then we came back and we did constitutional amendments on marriage between a man and a woman. Now, the reason we did that is the 2010 election was about us willing people demanding, Tea Partiers, conservatives, whatever group you happen to be from, demanding that we push the power away from our title, away from Raleigh, and back down to the people of North Carolina. All the laws and all the regulation that have ever been written in North Carolina would barely fit in this room. But all the things that you've ever had an opportunity to vote on would fit in the palm of your hand. 
which is the North Carolina Constitution. So we push that power down the way. But I want you to look back at all the legislative successes, the medical malpractice reform, the tort reform, the workers' comp reform, the marriage amendment, the redistricting, balancing the budget, cutting the sales taxes. I want you to know that we're not sitting in Mecklenburg, Wake County, Raleigh, Charlotte, Winston-Salem. We're not. We're not sitting in a. We're not sitting in a in a major city right now. We're sitting in Western North Carolina. And but for the fact, but for the fact of Senator Davis sitting there, a lot of that would not have happened. Do you think that I would have been able to reform the workers' comp system? if we had not had a veto-proof majority in the North Carolina Senate? Do you think that we would have been able to cut the sales tax and balance the budget if we had not had a veto-proof majority in the North Carolina Senate? Do you think that we would have been able to pass the first unborn victims legislation in North Carolina's history, which allows for the charging of two murders for harming or murdering a pregnant woman, but for the supermajority of the Senate? The fact is, don't ever, ever underestimate the power of this community. You're not Charlotte, and you're not Rob, but you sent a senator there who beat someone who would have voted. He may have, that person may have voted, who knows how they would have voted on those bills, but they would have never voted for the leadership necessary that allowed all of that legislation to be heard. So I'll close by telling you that my last name's Falwell. And you've got to ask yourself as you go into the May primary, do you think that one person can really make a difference? The answer is yes, you can. You can make a difference in this election. Send people to Raleigh who understand that the root word of conservative is to conserve. Send people to Raleigh who understand that when they put that left hand on the Bible like Senator Davis and raise their right hand to uphold the Constitution of North Carolina, and when they think about the conservative platform and the Republican platform, send people to Raleigh that when it comes to time to vote, many of you have been to Raleigh and you know that on our desk there's a red button and a green button. Send people to Raleigh that the last thing that goes through their mind is what are my people back home expecting me to do. That's what Senator Davis does, 342 miles from here. The last thing that goes through his mind, as important as the Bible is, as important as the Constitution is, as important as the conservative Republican platform is, the last thing to go through his mind before he presses red or green is what are my people back home expecting me to do. The reason I'm standing and you're sitting is that I understand and Senator Davis understands that you're the employer. The taxpayers, the voters, and the citizens of this state are the employer and we work for you. My last name is Falwell. My time is up and I thank you for yours and I appreciate your vote.